Um, okay, so I'm here with Michael Rush. Um, he's an author, a biblical scholar, historian, scriptorian, and we're going to be discussing the political signs of the times. So I wanted to thank you, first of all, for being willing to do this. This is really exciting for me. I mainly wanted to do this uh, because I've seen a lot of interest, I'm sure you have too, on social media over the signs of the times. Um, there's that funny meme going around about revelations, um, which makes sense because things are a little bit crazy in 2020. And uh, a lot of those signs deal with disasters and things like that. But I've noticed that in your books, you talk about a lot of things that deal with um, the political signs of the times and the political turmoil we're seeing here in 2020. So whether you're watching this as a member of our same church, a fellow Christian, or just simply someone who might be trying to put political turmoil and craziness of 2020 in scriptural context, um, I hope at the very least this interview draws you toward the Savior and the point of all of this. I hope that it is a little bit of a motivator for you to get prepared for the second coming. Um, so with that, um, why don't you just start off real quick what, by telling us your background um, and maybe why you got interested in this study in the first place. As far as my, my background, you know, I'm uh, a CPA. I you know, started my career in public accounting uh, in San Francisco working for Ernst & Young. And you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as an accountant, um, you dive into a lot of data uh, and I got good at looking at data to find patterns and you know as I started studying these topics I found patterns throughout the scriptures uh, you mentioned at the beginning a little bit about the signs of the times well a lot of people study these signs without the proper context and I think that the things that we're going to be talking about today provide the context for these signs that are happening all around Awesome. Yeah. And that's, I was going to say, you know, I've been interested in the study of the second coming and uh, I know a lot of different videos and information have been going around, especially lately. Um, but as I read your books, I just became really fascinated and impressed by the context, like you said, that was given because I'd come across interpretations previously that, you know, talked about the verse and interpreted that verse, but it didn't provide the added context of the other visions and revelations that you bring into that. And then the historical context as well just provides so much clarity, um, which is why I just found it so interesting. So um, you mentioned that there have been others that have tackled Ezra's eagle after you. First of all, were you the first one to publish your understanding and interpretation of Ezra's eagle? And also you said they kind of divorced the meaning that you had intended to be taken from that interpretation. So can you speak to that a little bit? Well, Bible scholars for, for years have thought Ezra's eagle pertained to ancient Rome, for instance. So there's that interpretation. Um, then other people said, ah, this is an ancient Rome. This is, this is the popes over time. And you know, I, I'm the first um, person that you know, I, I've seen anywhere uh, that said, no, this, this isn't ancient Rome. This isn't um, the popes. And, and in my book, I go through and detail exactly why that's the case. In this vision, there are so many things that Ezra saw that it's impossible for all of those things to line up as perfectly as they do with America and not be related to it. And, you know, so I, I'm the first person that's put that together. But since I put you know, my analysis together on Ezra's Eagle. I mean, there's now literally thousands. Uh, if, you, if you Google Ezra's Eagle, I mean, you're going to see 100,000 different it's very popular. Uh, yeah. you know, things on it. Um, but, yeah, like you, you said, it's, it's not in the proper context. I mean, if you're just focused on signs, I mean, th these signs have been happening since there was a nation. I mean, there's always been wars and rumors of wars. There's always been earthquakes in diverse places. The ocean has heaved beyond, beyond its bounds. Even elements have melted in fervent heat before. I mean, if you were a saint during uh, World War II, you were checking off all these boxes. You thought Christ was coming, you know, immediately. But what you, if you're just focused on signs without the context, then, you know, 
you can be confused. I mean, there's lots of people that are, you know, preaching that, uh, hey, the seven years of trial started with the, you know, first solar eclipse in 2017. It's going to end in 20, you know, 24. I mean, I can see how people can say that stuff if they're just looking at signs, but when you bring in this context, there's no way that that's true. So that context is very important to understand when you're talking about Ezra's evil, if you really want to understand this. I love that. And I love that you spoke to some of those other videos because I know that they're also very popular and there's, there's a lot of interpretations going around right now. Um, and so that, that kind of reminds me, before we jump in here and start talking about Ezra's Eagle, um, I just wanted to talk about, you know, probably one of the main pushbacks or reservations that I hear from people, and I imagine it's similar with you, is that the reason we don't talk about revelations and we don't talk about the visions is because they are so ambiguous, right? And because in, in Matthew 24, that Christ says, no man knows the day or the hour. But if you put that scripture in context, he said that after the disciples came to him and said, when is the end of the world? How can we know that this is coming? And he goes on to detail, like you said, all of these signs that people have seen, you know, throughout, throughout history and throughout time. Um, but one of them in specific that he says is that um, the people's love will wax cold, right? Their hearts will wax cold and they'll offend one another and hate one another. That seems very timely to me. Um, and uh, anyway, and then at the end, he says, you know, here's the parable of the fig tree. Learn the parable of the fig tree. When it drops its leaves, you know that the time is coming, right? That the season is nice. So that's when you know that it's at the doors. So for me, I find this topic really interesting because I feel like it's important to know the signs so that we can prepare ourselves spiritually because no amount of preparation or knowledge, I mean, you know so much of the context and the signs that we're talking about, but that alone won't save you, right? You have to keep everything in the perspective of the Savior and the second coming of the Savior, and only spiritual preparation and drawing close to our Savior will prepare us truly for that day and that time that we're about to discuss. So anyway, um, there's such a wealth of knowledge and in your books, and uh, we couldn't possibly cover all of that here. Um, so I have linked uh, your website in the video description below and links to uh, your videos at the end of this interview. Um, but in the best way that we possibly can, we're going to condense some of this uh, to give people an idea of what um, political signs of the times are contained in your studies and your books. So just to give kind of an outline of what we're going to be talking about, first we'll discuss Ezra's ego and your interpretation that Trump and uh, the next president will be removed from office by unnatural causes. Then we'll talk about the three eagle heads or leaders of the deep state that rise to power and fall one after another. And after all that, we'll talk about what comes next in the prophecy, which is the stout horn or the Antichrist and his reign in America. Then we'll wrap up by discussing what the scriptures say will happen to expel the Antichrist from America and the persecutions that the saints will undergo in those days and possibly some preparations that we can put forth to be prepared for those days. And of course, all of this ends with um, the second coming of our Lord and Savior who destroys the Antichrist and the wicked and brings peace, which is what all of this study is about in the first place. So can you just start off by giving us a summary of Ezra's Eagle? Yeah, so Ezra's eagle, um, I, I mean, it's this vision that Ezra saw, and he sees this giant eagle, right? And this eagle has three heads, and it, in his vision, he sees that it, it dominates the entire earth. He's told by this angelic guide who is with him that the feathers on this eagle represent consecutive leaders that serve in this country that's represented by the eagle, one after another. And the uh, angelic guy says, you heard this voice coming from this eagle's bowels. That's a sign that this country is in distress. And in fact, it's going to be so, it's going to get so bad for this country that it will be at the point of collapsing, but it will be restored to its beginning. And that also, preludes some of the, these other interpretations like ancient Rome, uh, which started out as a Roman Republic and, and then went to a dictatorship under the Caesars. It never really went back to you know, its original Roman Republic. But 
when you get into the specifics of these feathers, it matches perfectly with the presidents of the United States. Now, it breaks, there's 20 feathers in total, but the vision breaks out the first 14 separately from the last six. And it specifically calls out the second feather. And this is how you can identify who these leaders are. Because it says that the second feather will serve twice as long as any other feather, and that before the end of his time, no, no other feather will be able to serve more than half as long as he did. So that is incredibly specific. And again, if you go back to book leaders, you'd have to find a country where you had one leader who served a really long time and then no one else serving half, you know, more than half, as long as he did. Right. And you just can't find a country with that kind of uh, leadership except for here in the United States. And you look, you know, at until FDR, who the, he's the only president in the United States history to be elected to four terms in office. And then during his fourth term, Congress said, hey, we got to stop. And so they passed, um, I believe it was the 22nd Amendment to say no our presidents serving more than two terms in office. So that doesn't sound similar to what Ezra was talking about. It sounds exactly the same to what Ezra's talking about. And then Ezra says, amongst these 14 um, feathers that rule this kingdom um, consecutively, you're going to have two of those feathers whose time in office is to be cut short by unnatural means. And that when you see the second of these two feathers, you can know that the uh, middle point, of midpoint of this timeline is about to be reached. So you look at that series of presidents, given that FDR has to be the second because he's the only U.S. president that you know, qualifies. Um, then you look at JFK, who was assassinated in office during this period of time. And then you have uh, Richard Nixon, who was forced to resign uh, prematurely. In this graphic, I've listed the 14 presidents, and I put a little bar underneath um, Richard Nixon. And when you go from the first president in this series, which is Herbert Hoover, to the last president in the series, which is Barack Obama, um, at the end of Richard Nixon's term, you got two years to a perfect 50-50 split, right? And so that lights up perfectly with what Ezra was saying as well. Then I mentioned that there were six other feathers that Ezra saw. And he distinguishes in his vision uh, presidents whose terms in office are cut short by calling them short feathers, and feathers whose terms in office are normal, meaning they served you know, their allotted time in office, um, or at least they weren't removed through unnatural means, um, those are considered long feathers. So the last remaining six feathers in this vision are all short, meaning that all of them, their allotted time will be cut short for unnatural means, which is very interesting given, you know, the current environment with President Trump. Ever since he was elected, which, you know, he was never supposed to win, right? I remember, you know, watching the election coverage, you know, in 2016 and seeing Nate Silver come on and, you know, tell the audience that uh, Hillary Clinton had this thing in the bag and yeah. it was like 90% chance that she was going to win. <laughs> And then, you know, by the end of the night, Trump has won it. You know, it was, it was phenomenal and very shocking. And ever since, they have been trying to remove him. And uh, before Trump took office, the average American citizen had probably never even heard of the term 
deep state. Yeah. But, <laughs> but he campaigned on that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a household word now. Yeah. I mean, everybody hears about this now. And we have never had a president who has had so much opposition. I mean, over 90% of the media coverage on him is negative. He's been impeached. You know, there have been no end to the different kinds of schemes, insurance policies to try to get him out of office. But, you know, he has hung in there. And regardless of what you think of President Trump and the way that he does things, he is where he is for a reason. According to Ezra's prophecy, he will be removed from office by unnatural means. And that the next president after him will be in office for even less time than he was. And then the next two feathers, they won't even have the opportunity to, to serve. It says that they will think in their hearts, hey, we want to be the president, but they're taken out yeah. by the three, these three eagle heads. They awake and attack and destroy them. And then those three eagle heads take over the United States of America and, you know, start running things the way that they want it to be run. It's by unnatural causes, so could that be possibly the elections contested? These puppet masters behind the scenes, they have their mitts in all forms of media, right? Entertainment media, news media, um, social media through censorship and agenda-driven fact checks and shadow banning, that kind of thing, right? The money trails all lead back to the same group of people. And they've already, through those outlets, laid the foundations for this election to be contested. I, both sides have already basically said that they will contest this election no matter how it turns out or whether they can prove voter fraud, which has apparently already been committed, right? Something like that could count? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of ways that this could happen. I don't know how closely you're following the news, but, I mean, we have key battleground states, like Pennsylvania, for example, that, you know, that state Supreme Court has come out and said, hey, we are going to allow ballots to be counted up to, geez, it was like eight or nine right. days after the election. Yeah. So it, even without a, <laughs> a postmark stamp, this will be the first time that I am aware of that in Pennsylvania where they're going to have ballot collection boxes that don't go through the post office. So you can go and put your ballots in there and then they'll collect them and count them up. Yeah. So literally, I mean, if you're a bad guy or part of a bad organization, I mean, it's something that could literally be that insane. Um, so yeah, election fraud could be a way uh, that this happens. So um, I, when I was reading this part in your book, I remembered that a friend of mine had done a Facebook Live uh, video where he talked about going to the Republican National Convention, and he said that he was speaking, um, or his friend was speaking with one of the chairmen of that convention, I think this was in 2016, and that he said, oh, we don't care who wins. And they were like, oh yeah, you know, as long as they're Republican, right, we don't care who wins. And he was like, no, you don't get it. We don't care who wins the presidency. And they were just shocked, um, and they didn't understand why he would, you know, say that. But as long as we keep the, our divided two-party system, these politicians or this deep state, these establishment politicians, um, can continue to have their pockets lined by our division, right? Um, so it does make you kind of wonder, as President Trump campaigns on draining that swamp, um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you call it the deep state or... Uh, you know, corrupt elites, conspiring men, whatever you want to call it, this existence of a deep state or a group of people that are conspiring and benefiting from using the citizens as pawns in their games of divide and conquer. Um, so I think that's, that's really interesting that the eagle heads awake to that because it's a threat to their behind the scenes power. So the message here is, hey, there is a deep state. It's, it's a secret combination. It's, it's the whore of Babylon. I mean, it's called many different things in the scriptures. But it is a self-serving organization that appears one way on the surface, but underneath is, is totally different. 
and has exercised incredible power in Washington. The presidents may change and the political party in power may change, which means the rhetoric changes, but the agenda stays the same. Right. And the reason why the agenda stayed the same is because the power behind the throne never changed until President Trump. Yeah, and that's why that stuck out to me so much where he said that they don't care who wins the presidency because ultimately they follow, like you said, the same general agenda. We're moving in the same general direction, the erosion of our Constitution in our country until Trump comes and these eagle heads awaken because he's not following the protocol, right? So as we move on from there, um, the vision talks about how the Antichrist or the Stout Horn comes to power after um, the eagle heads reign, right? So short feathers taken out, eagle heads reign, and we'll talk about that. Um, but that at some point before the Antichrist reigns after the eagle heads, that, that he was basically brought into this, uh, this secret combination, this brotherhood of ten horns that is the deep state or whatever you want to call it, right, behind the scenes. So can you talk about that for a second, how, you know, behind the scenes, um, before we go into the reign of the eagle heads, how the stout horn or the Antichrist gets brought into and, and uh, introduced to this group? So, this is why Christ said, hey, when you see this Antichrist, even the very elect, according to the covenant, can be deceived. And unless I shorten the duration of this period of time, no one's going to be left. No one's going to make it. So, this, when, when we talk about signs of the times in context, I'm amazed at how many people talk about the signs of the times and leave this part out of it. Um, the Antichrist is a major factor for the latter days. Um, and so if you're reading in Daniel 11, Daniel 11 sees three consecutive leaders, the first of which, which takes power after Trump is taken out, he, people are very suspicious of him. You know, um, he said, you know, Daniel says that there's a reproach to his kingdom. And, you know, so he's desperate to kind of have a shiny object kind of scenario where he can say, well, look up, look at this. Look what's going on over here. Stop looking at me. <laughs> and uh, Daniel says that he goes to war in the Middle East. And at the same time, while he's doing this, he becomes aware of this Antichrist. And whether the world at large becomes aware of the Antichrist at the same point in time or not, I can't tell you. But this guy becomes aware of him. And he tries to bring him in to his group. And Daniel said that there's there's ten of these guys. And, you know, when bad guys get control, they want absolute control. So right now, these three eagle heads, they're around, and they're part of this secret combination, the whore of Babylon, the deep state, whatever you want to call it. They're part of it, but they're part of a much larger group, and they have people pulling their strings as well, and they don't like that. Once they get uh, the power for themselves, they form their own little sub subgroup, and Daniel uh, calls them ten horns, um, and most of them haven't received a kingdom yet, but they believe that they will as a result of this unholy alliance. In them. And so they bring the stout horn in to their group, and the way they, that they do it is very interesting, because this, you know, powerful leader gives the stout horn the daughters of women. Right, not just women, but the daughters yeah. of women. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I mean, that is very Epstinian in its yes. you know, connotations, right? I mean, that's the way that Jeffrey Epstein's you know, network gained power over politicians, right? Right. Come over to his island, come over to his house, unbeknownst to them, there's cameras in every room, and now... He's got leverage of, I mean, we're not, affairs happen every day in Washington, D.C. 
but pedophilia, that's totally different. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's serious blackmail. Yeah. In your book, you said something to the effect of you'd have to be crazy to believe the lies they're telling about Epstein's death, right? I mean, there was clearly so much more to that. And that's why, you know, Epstein didn't kill himself was trending for like ever after that happened. Um, but of course, if they stay quiet about it long enough, people just let it go. Um, but we knew that there were other things at play there, you know, from the deal that he cut the first time to the report that he had recorded these encounters in order to blackmail elites, right? So the scriptures um, that you're talking about sound exactly like this, right? Given the daughters of women almost as a way to blackmail them into or have leverage over these new members. And uh, you talk about how um, with the stout horn or the antichrist that this doesn't go over as smoothly as it did with the others who previously had just, you know, become a part of the group and accepted that leverage and protected each other, right? This super strong form of blackmail that instead that it maybe gave rise to uh, his motivations to take out the eagle heads and reign himself, right? So can you speak about that? Yeah, so Daniel says that this stout horn comes up and plucks out three of the foremost uh, leaders by their roots and supplants them. He becomes the new leader. Um, and so Ezra's vision says the same thing. It says that these three eagle heads die one right after the other. The first one dies in his bed in great pain. So from some apparent sickness, which the stout horn was behind. Uh, the second one is murdered by the third one. And the third one is killed very shortly after he gets power. And the stout horn is somehow behind all three of their deaths. And so, obviously, if you have your three, you know, chosen, you know, favorite sons or daughters, the deep, speaking of the deep state, and they just fall one after another, after years of all this careful planning, then you're suspicious. You know, something's rotten in Denmark. And the stout horn steps forward. And uh, Daniel said, they didn't want to give him the glory of the kingdom. But he obtains the kingdom through flatteries. So he shouldn't have been able to obtain the kingdom. But he comes in and, because again, because of who he is, what he can do, um, and his flattering words, I mean, this guy is going to be a talker. And he gets the kingdom. And the first thing that he does, once he gets the kingdom, meaning America, once he's in charge of America, is he completely routes the deep state. He destroys the whore of Babylon. Um, he and his little fellowship of ten horns. And, you know, they're gone, you know. And then he has the reign of the whole earth at this point. And so, I mean, if you're, you know, a global citizen, right, and you're, you're suspecting that there's all of this nefarious activity going on, this deep state and, you know, peculiar things where certain people never get prosecuted, and other people can't, you know, I mean, are, you know, unrighteously prosecuted. Uh, you know there's something wrong, and then this guy's going to come, and he's going to lay it all out and utterly destroy them. And I think that's going to buy him a lot of credibility with people. He's coming in with solutions, and he gets rid of some of the problems that they could not get rid of them for themselves. The Lord uses the wicked to destroy the wicked. Uh, so that's his first big thing in office. That's that's kind of how he, you know, relates with these ten horns and specifically with these three that he, you know, destroyed. That's really interesting. Um, there are a couple things that I really wanted to touch on, and one of those things is the fact that I think one of the most important th reasons to understand this is that the Antichrist destroys the faith of 
basically everybody, right? There are very few believers left. And even those that do believe um, will abandon their faith because the persecutions are so great, right? And it, it makes me think of something else that um, I've been studying and thinking about this week with our religious freedom already being under attack. I mean, we're already at a point in our society, and we kind of saw this with the Supreme Court nomination also, um, but where if you are a person of faith um, and your faith influences your perspective on everything, including your politics, as it probably should, that you should not be allowed to participate in the public discourse because your faith is a part of that and this whole concept of... Um, moral relativism, right? Where what you think is moral is not what someone else thinks is moral. And therefore, if you are a person of faith, you should not be able to participate in the conversation um, when it comes to our laws and legislation. So um, I think we're already seeing that. And then what the Antichrist then does seems like not such a far cry away from where we are already at. And the other thing that what you um, talk about has made me think of is that this Antichrist, he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. Um, which means he's a popular person and that he deceives the general population of the United States. Otherwise, he would never be able to obtain um, the presidency or whatever it's called at that point without the support of the deep state, but he doesn't have that. So I think it's really important for us to recognize that he is going to be very smart about the way that he um, attacks religion. It's going to be a popular thing that he does. We're already on that track, but he kind of puts the nail in the coffin. So I think it's super important to recognize that a lot of pe many people, maybe probably the majority of believers, will lose their faith um, and stop attending church. So for me, it's really important to recognize those signs because he's going to be popular politically, which means that we need to be really careful about who we throw our weight behind and maybe not um, maybe not believing in people and politicians as much as we believe in principles, right? Ground ourselves on the Savior and stay centered on that because ultimately um, someone's going to be very deceptive and very successful in that deceit. He wouldn't be able to be um, so successful in persecuting the saints if he didn't have widespread support of that persecution. So um, that's what that makes me think of. And then, you know, you talk about the kings of the north and of the south, and how conflicts with the Middle East will play a really strong role in all of this, and that the stout horn of the Antichrist even uses um, that conflict with the Middle East as a way to kind of warn the the believers that, hey, if you don't abandon your faith, like this is what you have to look forward to, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you talk about in your book, uh, ISIS and what they were trying to accomplish, and I found that really interesting. So can you uh, talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you dig into Islam, um, like, it, you might be surprised to know, like I've read the Quran, for instance, the Muslims believe that Jesus Christ was an incredible prophet, that he did miracles that other people weren't able to do. But they also believe that he was not the Son of God, and that when it came time for him to be crucified, that God made someone that looked just like him, and that person was crucified, and Christ was taken up. And that he will return to the earth in the last days when there is an Antichrist you know, upon the earth. And that Jesus Christ will confront that Antichrist and destroy the Antichrist and and usher in you know, the millennial reign. And so that is what ISIS was trying to do. It's important to understand that the people in the Islamic countries, they see a different side of us. They see the American military industrial complex. And you know, so they have leaders over there that are viewing America as the great Satan. In fact, you've, I'm sure you've heard Iran, you know, chant, you know, death to, you know, America, death to the great saint. Well, they look at America as the Antichrist. And so ISIS was thinking, okay, we want to usher in the end of the world. And the way to do that is to go to war against the Antichrist, which is America, uh, in their... Um, 
beliefs. So you say they kind of got so, tired of waiting, right? And so they're trying to, yeah, right. they're trying to usher in the second coming by forming the caliphate. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, a very important tenet to Islam is you know, having a caliphate. And they thought, okay, if we establish a caliphate, um, someplace for Christ to return to, and we go to war against the Antichrist, we're going to force Christ to come. And, and so that's what they were trying to do. And so when the actual Antichrist arrives, the Muslim people are going to identify him like that. So, yeah, the Muslims are, are really going to key in on the Antichrist. Just like and ISIS was trying to take that part of Islam and leverage it to establish the caliphate and to usher in the second coming. That's what they were trying to do. Because they know, they know the prophecies. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Let me just try to recap here. So Trump took out ISIS and basically scaled back our involvement in the Middle East, right? You kind of talk about that in your book. But then the first eagle head reignites that conflict um, kind of as a distraction um, or a way to like garner support, right? And then the second eagle head kind of ends that again. Um, the stout horn, when he comes into power, the king of the south and the nations of Islam recognize him. What does that prompt them to do and how does he respond to them? I mean, if you've thought uh, the Middle East has been a powder keg in the past, uh, when he arrives and when he arrives in America, I mean, it's just going to be like nothing we've ever seen before. So the stout horn is going to go over there to put an end to it. And uh, when he arrives, I mean, Daniel says that he forecasts his devices against the uh, uh, king of the south. And the king of the south has amassed uh, an incredible army. You know, ISIS pulled fighters from over 80 countries. So you can imagine in this kind of a scenario, there's going to be an incredible rallying cry in the Muslim communities. Mm -hmm. So um, Daniel says that the king of the south has a huge host, but that uh, the stout horn or the Antichrist comes in there and just with his uh, devices just mows them down to such an incredible degree that you know, they're shocked, they're terrified by it. And they try to get their leaders to call, call a ceasefire just so they can you know, get their wits about them. Uh, their leaders don't want to do it. So some people poison their own leaders and kill them so that new people can go and uh, declare a ceasefire with the Antichrist. And, and Daniel says that when they do this, that both parties are speaking lies at the table. And in other words, neither side really believes that they're negotiating in good faith. So the ceasefire, they both know it's not going to last. But the stout horn, in order to stop his hostilities, he, he charges them an incredible sum of money. And he walks away from this, greatly enriched from it. And the Muslims are trying to just, you know, come up with an alternate game plan for how they can, you know, attack someone as powerful as this Antichrist is. So it's kind of a uh, false peace, but the Stout Horn does leave and return to America. And from my reading of the text, it seems like this is the time where he just goes all out against organized religion in general, yeah, saying, okay. you see what happens over there. Um, you know, this kind of organized religion just produces chaos. I think he'll have evidence for, you know, how, you know, historically most of the wars have been fought, you know, over, you know, differences in religious opinions. That's already and, an argument going around. Yeah. Yeah. And his arguments are going to be very, very convincing. And as a result, I think global faith is going to collapse. But still, in America, there are going to be people, and, and across the world for that matter, that are going to say, you know what? I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I, I feel it in my heart. There's nothing that this guy can say that's going to make me you know, believe any different. And that is really going to upset this guy. And so he's going to you know, ratchet up 
his persecution of the saints. And uh, both uh, Daniel and John the Revelator um, wrote that he would totally overcome the saints and that the saints would be given into his hand for a season. To me, that means, I mean, we're, you know, we are going to be oppressed. I would imagine we would not be able to practice our religion, certainly in congregations. Um, I foresee that, you know, all churches being closed, not just COVID closed, but closed, closed, you know, temples being closed. Um, and, you know, kind of like what you've seen in the past where laws were, you know, passed against public prayer, you know, praying at all. Um, so we won't, we will be subjected to those kinds of um, rules. And that's where the mark of the beast and not being allowed to buy or sell would probably come into play, right? Um, I was thinking about this um, today as I was reviewing our interview, and it just made me think of the fact that I think COVID gave us a glimpse into what that could look like, right? Where I think so many of us, you know, I, I support our Second Amendment, I support our Constitution, and I think the Second Amendment is the one thing that has stood in the way of just an immediate seizing of power from corrupt officials or from the deep state. But they know that they can poison us by degrees over time, and that if they do that, they'll never get to a point where we can justify the use of arms to protect and defend our religious liberties and our freedom. So if they can do that slowly over time, you know, over the process of this entire thing from Ezra's Eagle to the Stouthorn, that, you know, just like with the ten virgins, all ten virgins were waiting and planning to be admitted to the wedding feast. And of those 10, half of them were not prepared, right? So if we're not going to be allowed to buy or sell, that just makes me think, man, we, especially in our church, we've been given so much instruction, specific instruction to get out of debt and have a food storage. And I think so many times we think of this in terms of the disasters that are prophesied in Revelations, right? The natural disasters. But for me, these political signs of the times are an even greater reason to be prepared because it may get to a point, like you said, we're given into his hand. We're hoping with a little help and about ready to fall before we're saved, which we'll talk about here in a second. But I think there are going to be people that intended to stay strong and keep the faith, but can't because they didn't prepare spiritually or temporally, right? I, that's just what it makes me think of. Because if we get to a point where, okay, you're choosing between uh, making a living for yourself and putting food on the table and denouncing your faith or keeping the faith and having to struggle through those times, people are going to have to really challenge their testimonies. And even if they keep their testimony, like I think you said in your book at one point, the persecutions may be so strong that they choose to um, abandon their religion or their faith. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think that that is true. I think that the most important uh, preparations that we're going to, you know, be able to make in advance are spiritual preparations, because I do believe that the time is going to come where, just like the House of Israel, when they left Egypt and they were, you know, in the wilderness of Sinai, I mean, that, 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 that wilderness, that desert was not flowing with milk and honey. So they were entirely dependent upon the Lord. And the Lord provided for them in miraculous ways. Yeah. And so just like Israel in the past, we are going to need to depend on the Lord and not on the arm of flesh. I mean, John specifically said in, his, uh, in the book of Revelation that... When the saints are overcome, he says, this is the patience of the saints. He that lives by the sword will die by the sword. So in other words, endure this trial well with faith, our faith in him intact, even though it's going to be very challenging. I mean, it, uh, that is, in fact, the whole point of this. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think that probably for me, the greatest blessing of understanding these uh political signs of the times is that it does prompt you and motivate you to get to fortify yourself and shore up your testimony. Um, okay, so back to um, the timeline that we were talking about here. So what is the abomination of desolation and how do we know this is the second one? Okay, that's a, a great question. So 
you know, we learn about the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, but it's Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, where the apostles come to him on the Mount of Olives and they're asking him, hey, can you talk to us about, you know, what it's going to be like, what the signs will be like when you come again? And so that's when there's going to be two events that Christ is talking about. First, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he refers to that event being triggered by the first abomination of desolation. And what happened with that was, you know, Gaius Caligula became emperor of Rome, and, you know, he was kind of crazy, um, but he was totally fed up with the Jews. And so he said, you know, Roman emperors are gods, and the Jews should be worshiping us because we're gods. So I am in particular a god, and so I'm going to have a statue of myself created out of gold, and I'm going to ship it over to Jerusalem, and I'm going to force them to put this in the Holy of Holies, and all the Jews will worship me because I'm a god. And so he made the statue, shipped it over. Uh, when it arrived in Israel, they went crazy. Uh, they attacked um, the Romans. They destroyed the statue. Um, Caligula went berserk, and you know Jerusalem was razed to the ground. Um, Josephus said that you know a million Jews were killed, in that. Mm. and you know only a tenth were taken you know to Rome in slavery. So. The Christians, they saw those events and said, hey, this is the abomination of desolation that uh, Daniel was talking about and that Christ warned us that when you see this, flee from Jerusalem. And so the Christians left Jerusalem in advance and they were spared. Now, Christ said there will be a second abomination of desolation that will happen in the last days and that once that is placed then the heavens will shake and the stars will fall uh, from the sky. And so... And that, talk, and that deliverance is nigh, right? So that's also the sign for yeah. us. Okay, yeah. And yeah, that, that, that is exactly right. So the sign of the second abomination of desolation is the sign that our deliverance is you know, at hand. Um, it's going to be very bad when that happens because Paul talked you know, about the Antichrist literally going into the temple of God and claiming to be God. Uh, Caligula tried to get an image of himself in there, but uh, the Antichrist literally in our day will stand within the temple and say, hey, this is the house of the Lord. I am the Lord, therefore I worship me. And doesn't so, Daniel when, say that he does what his fathers couldn't do, yeah, right? Referencing yeah. maybe Caligula. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So Daniel said, he does what his fathers uh, did not. So he accomplishes this. And you know, then the heavens are shaken and stars fall from the sky, which mark the deliverance of Israel. And how that deliverance takes place is spectacular. Yes. Okay, so let's move on to that. So um, can you just tell us about, okay, so the stout horns preparing to end the conflict in the Middle East, right? Um, he's mm -hmm. sick and tired of that conflict. He's preparing to just go wipe them out. So while he's preparing to do this, or is it while he's on his way over, he's repelled by the stars, these stars, or the ships of Chittim. Um, mm -hmm. So can you clarify that? And then just tell us what details the scriptures give us about the appearance of these stars or ships and the passengers mm -hmm. on them. Yeah, so... Um you know, the, uh, I spoke earlier about how the Muslims, they are not going to sit on their hands for long. So they would rather die fighting against, you know, the Antichrist than live in shame. Um, this is, I mean, the whole religion is based off of this. This is what jihad is all about. Mm. So they are going to boil over again and the Antichrist is going to say, okay, that's it. You're done. And as he's preparing to go over and just wipe them off the map, um, the ships of Chittim come. And remember, 
The stout horn has these devices that nobody can counter. That's why he's able to just wipe, you know, the uh, Muslims, you know, with such ferocity in the in his first attack against them. But this time, these mysterious ships of Chittim come, and he's rebuffed, and he's totally shocked by it, and he's totally barred from entering America um, because of the strength of this incredible host, which Jeremiah said, when they return, uh, their return will rival the exodus of Egypt. Um, wow. And, it, you know, in Ezekiel, he described, describes these ships of Chittim um, uh, as these wheels within a wheel that descend down from heaven and can move at the speed of lightning. And they bring with them these creatures that have four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now, that is definitely symbolic because those four um, symbols, the man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle, are the ensigns of the house of Israel. Uh, when the tabernacle of the congregation was you know, in the wilderness for 40 years, the, uh, Israel was divided into four camps, and each camp had a standard. Uh, Judah was the lion, um, the camp of Ephraim was the ox, and then you had uh, Reuben and Dan, which were an eagle and a man, respectively, the silhouette of a man's head. So what you have being described in Ezekiel chapter 1 is the hosts of Israel returning and that results in the miraculous um, deliverance of uh, Israel. Now, s some more evidence that this is actually talking about the hosts of Israel. Um, before uh, the Israelites were allowed to enter into Canaan, um, they, the Lord made another covenant with them. He had made a, a covenant with them on Mount Sinai. Now he makes another co covenant uh, with them before they enter in, and this this into the land of Canaan. And this covenant is found uh, in Deuteronomy. And if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 4, um, Moses is uh, describing the terms of the covenant and says, hey, if you go into these pro this promised land and you forsake the covenants, then the Lord is going to scatter you to the ends of the earth. But the day will come when, if you remember these covenants and keep them, then I will gather you together again from whatsoever land you are scattered. And if there be those of thine that are scattered to the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will I gather them. And so yeah, that seems a peculiar thing for Moses to say. I mean, why would that even be you know, an option of, Hey, yeah, and if you're out in the heavens, we're going to bring you back. <laughs> and um, Christ says uh, the same thing to, uh, not in uh, Matthew 24, but I believe it's in Mark where he's you know, having the same conversation. He, he says, hey, in that day, Israel will be gathered in from the ends of the earth and from the ends of heaven. And you, you can, and, and literally, there are many, many scriptures that talk about this, but I'll, you know, I'll give you another uh, example. In Isaiah, I believe this is Isaiah chapter 13, um, Isaiah is talking about the Lord has his sanctified ones will come in the last days, and they will come from a far country, from the ends of heaven, the weapons of the Lord's indignation to destroy the whole land. And then it says, how will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. <clears throat> so, you know, we're talking about this miraculous deliverance by these, by the ships of Chittim, which are described as stars falling from the heaven or lights descending uh, to the earth from the heavens uh, that are powerful enough to rebuff the stout horn, the Antichrist. But Daniel says that even as powerful as the Chips, the ships of Chittim are, that he is able to take some of these stars and cast them to the ground and stamp upon them. But still he has overcome 
buy them in, and eject it from America. There's so much more to this that we're not going to get into, um, but I just wanted to talk with you for a second about the fact that all of this culminates with one thing, which is the second coming of the Savior, right? Um, the second coming of the Savior is the point of the study of all of this, right? So you as someone who has studied this extensively and is likely capable of being as prepared as possible um, due to those understandings, just speak a little bit to what preparations people need to undergo to truly be prepared to withstand that day and the, the political events that we've talked about. Um, well, I, I think that absolutely the most important preparation that anyone can have is spiritual it's um having the holy ghost in your life you are going to need to have an unshakable testimony in jesus christ because when this antichrist comes what he is able to say his his marvelous blasphemies which he utters um according to the scriptures um are going to shake people's faith the evidences that he is going to be able to produce um, are going to change the way that we perceive reality and our own history. So, I mean, unless you're rooted firmly through an ongoing witness of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to be possible to survive those days. So, yes, you can, you know, squirrel away money. Um, you can, you know, have food storage. Uh, you can do things like that, but ultimately, I think it's all going to come down to your personal testimony. And is there anything that could convince you that Jesus is not the Son of God? Awesome. Yeah, I've had I've had the same thoughts, and I think um, as I've thought about, okay, what you know, what benefit does this study yield me or you or anybody? Um, and ultimately, for me, what it is, is I, I, it doesn't make me more fearful. Um, it makes me excited. It makes me feel like this life is less of a long haul and more of a sprint to the end um, and endure the trials with faith and with hope. And um, I, think, I think the study of this topic and the second coming, as long as it is focused on Christ— and on the one preparation that can truly prepare us for those events, it can be a really great spiritual motivator. You know, remember that, um, I mean, disciples of Jesus Christ should follow his example, and especially now. Um, I mean, when we're at the dawn of, you know, his millennial reign. So, I mean, when the scriptures talk about standing in holy places, that when you see these, you know, violent protests where you have people on both sides. That's not a holy place in my mind. Um, you know, or even just the chaos to, on social media, just the, just even contributing to the chaos, even if you're not on the streets, right? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, you know, Paul talked about, Hey, if you don't have charity, you're nothing. Um, and so now is the time for charity. Uh, you know, we need to be forgiving, Bad things are going to happen to us. We need to turn the other cheek. We need to rely on the Lord to deliver us, not on the strength of our arms. And the Lord will deliver us in miraculous ways. But it's going to be a trial, and we should expect that. But we shouldn't give in to the anger and the hatred and the divisiveness that is being you know, peddled to us. We need to resist that and you know, follow the example of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, he was falsely accused. He was beaten. He was persecuted. And, you know, he endured it well. And we need to do the same thing. I love that. To center on Jesus Christ and the principles of the gospel and not on parties or politicians, I think. Yeah, That's right. I, I love that. Um, I really appreciate you doing this interview. Um and uh, I'm going to link at the end of this video, I'm going to link your channel and your videos. And then in the description, I will have a link to your website where you can find his books. And uh, he also has an audio book version, which is really awesome and, and helpful. So thank you. I really appreciate you doing this interview. All right. Thank you, Shalise. Thanks. Bye.